everybody, Grant Kemp here from creativecashflow.com. Today we're gonna to start off and talk about some basic understandings. What are some of the things that you're gonna to need to know as you get into this business, especially when dealing with owner financing. Owner financing being one of my favorite strategies, and so I'm gonna focus a little bit of, uh, more on that side of things today on this video, but you can watch other videos to learn more about some of the other strategies of wholesaling and fix and flipping and all that kind of good stuff. But let's kind of get into that. So let's start off with what is owner financing? What is owner financing at its core? What's happening? Well, at its core, all that happens on owner financing is that instead of the buyer paying Wells Fargo every month, they pay the seller. So what's gonna happen is the buyer's gonna get the deed to the property, but they're not gonna pay Wells Fargo. They're just gonna pay the seller. Whoever that is, that seller might be you, that seller might be your seller, right? Buyer, uh, buyer seller financing can take many shapes, right? You can use seller financing to purchase a property by having your seller finance it to you, or you can use seller financing to finance it to your end buyer, right? So there's, there's a lot going into the owner financing sides with different strategies, but at its core, it's just, hey, instead of paying a bank, you're paying a person. So let's talk about the, what I refer to as the owner financing tree. We've got many different strategies in owner financing, one of which is going to be the wraparound mortgage. The wraparound mortgage is an awesome way to, to really capitalize on arbitrage, meaning you're going to make you're going to make a, a, a mortgage to an end buyer that's got an interest rate at nine and a half percent, nine percent somewhere in there, but you're only paying debt at four percent or six percent or whatever that debt might be. Maybe your end mortgage is going to be for ninety thousand dollars, but your debt on the property is only fifty or sixty thousand dollars. You can watch a separate video on wraparound mortgages specifically, but that's really where you make a ton of money and have really uh, low liabilities in the deal. So I love wraparound mortgages. It, really, basically what it boils down to is a wraparound mortgage, you're, you're charging more every month than you have to pay, if that simplifies things for you, right? So as you bring a buyer in, they may be paying you $1,000 a month, but you're only paying $600 a month. Subject two. Subject two is essentially taking over on payments. Now, I don't want you to say taking over on payments to your seller. That's one of the, the, the phrases that I'm going to use when I'm talking to you but we're gonna stay away from that as you talk to your seller because when you say I'm gonna take over on your payments, that can imply some things. One of those implications is that the seller no longer has any liabilities on the deal. And we don't want them to feel that way because they need to understand that in a subject to transaction, even though you're going to take ownership of the property and you're going to be paying Wells Fargo for them, the phrase I want you to use is that you're paying on their behalf. You're paying on their behalf. Their name stays on the mortgage, okay? So subject two means you become the owner of the house, their name stays on the mortgage, but you're gonna keep making those payments on their behalf. That's what allows you to turn around and do something like a wraparound mortgage, right? And it allows you to buy a lot of houses because you're not having to put the cash up for those things. You're able to just take over on people's payments over and over and over again. You can buy 10 houses a month that way and not ever have to face a, a banker and get approved and show them your taxes and all that kind of stuff. So subject two is just an awesome way to purchase property. Subject two is gonna be a great thing to have in recessions. Subject two is one of those excellent strategies that you want in your back pocket whenever the values of property start going down or are in a slump because what's happened is up to that point, people have been buying properties, buying properties, buying properties, and they're at these inflated prices, right? Well, when the, fl when the inflation goes away, when the prices come down, they may be underwater, they may be at water, they may not have much equity. And subject two allows you to buy houses that don't have much equity and turn a lot of money on them. Keep watching this video series so that you can learn more about subject two, how to, how to really turn that into the cash flow that you're looking to get. Uh, but subject two is just an awesome strategy for those kinds of things to have, again, in your tool belt. Free and clear owner financing. This is gonna be the simplest form of owner financing there is, meaning there's a property that's owned free and clear and it's gonna get sold, but instead of any other financing being lined up, the buyer's just gonna pay the seller directly, right? So let's take an example. Let's say that you talk to Betty Jo, she's owned her house for the last 47 years. She paid it off 17 years ago. She owns it free and clear. She wants, it to, sell, uh, wants to sell it to you for $80,000. You say, okay, that's cool. I'll give you $80,000, but instead of me giving you cash today, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pay you $800 a month, every month for the next 
10 years or 15 years or whatever it is that you work out, right? That would be a free and clear owner financed deal. Those are the simplest forms of owner financing. That's going to be one of the ways that we really start to dive into the owner financing explanation because it's going to take away a lot of the other variables that we're having to worry about, like with subject to mortgage, with a wraparound, when you've got two mortgages in place. We'll talk just about the free and clear side of things first. Before we get into really the details of owner financing, one of the big fundamentals that you need to understand is a lien. What is a lien? What is a lien and what is lien position, okay? So first of all, let's talk about liens. What is a lien? Well, a lien is really, at its core, just debt on a property. That's really what liens are. Now, liens have to be a specific kind of debt on the property uh, to be able to attach to it, but let's run into some scenarios of what of our our most familiar liens are going to be? Well, first, a mortgage. A mortgage is the most familiar lien you're going to deal with, right? That's the one that everybody kind of understands how it works. A mortgage just says, hey, this person bought the house, and before they sell the house, I need to get paid off whatever they owe me, right? That's a mortgage. Everybody gets those. That's going to be what you run into on almost every property. Mechanics liens are also going to pop up semi-frequently. A mechanics lien says that there was work done to this house. Maybe, maybe a plumber came out and did some work and the seller decided not to pay that plumber for the work. Well, the plumber does have legal recourse. That plumber is able to actually file a lien in the county records that says, hey, I did work on 123 Main Street. They never paid me. I was supposed to get $2,000 for this job. I didn't get squat. So they have a lien for $2,000 on the property. That is a mechanics lien. Mechanics liens are able to get filed. Now there is statutes of limitation. There's things that you need to know about those. If you, if you run into a mechanics lien, don't freak out. Talk to your lawyer, uh, figure out what's going on with it. But you will find those out there. AC units, uh, plumbing, electrical, that kind of stuff. If they don't get paid, they can put a lien on the property. And again, a lien just says when the property gets sold, this lien holder gets paid before anybody else does, okay? So if the seller sells the house for 100, they owed 80 to the bank and they had a $2,000 lien to the mechanic, well, the title company is going to pay 80 of that 100 to the bank, title company is going to pay 2 of that 100 to uh, the mechanic's lien, and then the seller gets to walk away with the rest, minus the fees and all that kind of good stuff. What's another one? Tax. Both federal and property tax delinquencies can result in a lien on a property, okay? Now, I don't want you to freak out if you see a federal tax lien on a homesteaded property. At least here in Texas, and I can't speak for other states because I don't know uh, the intricacies of all the laws in other states, but I'm assuming it's very similar. But at least here in Texas, a homesteaded property, somebody, or a property that somebody has filed that says, this is my house, this is the one that I live in, if you've got an IRS lien, a, a federal tax lien, you can get that dropped off when trying to sell the property, especially and particularly when the seller is not making money from the sale, okay? So let's take this example again. Let's say that somebody owes $80,000 to Wells and they're selling their house uh, to you and you buy it for $80,000. Well, there may be a federal tax lien on there. There may be a tax lien that says, well, Joe actually owes the IRS $120,000 and at first glance, you may see that and say, oh my gosh, there's no way that I can buy this house from them because in order for the debt to be paid off, I'm going to have to come up with the 80 plus the 120. That's $200,000. This house is only worth 100 at best. So a lot of investors, they back away and they say, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going to touch that deal because I can't, I can't touch that deal. I can't come up with $200,000 to satisfy the liens that are on this property. But the trick is if it's a homesteaded property, you can remove that lien from that property as long as the seller's not making any money from it. If you buy it for $80,000, you can remove that, that $120,000. It will no longer attach to that property. Now, it's going to attach to other things that the seller has. If the seller has non-homesteaded property, say that the seller has a rental property out there, there's no way to detach that lien from that rental property. At that point in time, if that, if that rental property is sold, that lien needs to be taken care of in there as well. And that's not to say that the entire $120,000 has to be taken care of from that one rental property, but anything that's happening on top of what's owed on that rental or at all, that has to go towards that lien. So again, talk to your uh, attorneys, uh, figure that out if you see a federal tax lien, but I'll tell you, I've, I've, I've cleaned up uh, three or four deals that other investors had passed on 
because they saw a federal tax lien out there on the title search and they weren't willing to do anything with it anymore. Uh, so I came in behind them, I saw it was federal, I saw it was a homestead, and I still made a bunch of money on that deal. Child support is another lien that you're going to run into semi-frequently. Child support is one of those things where, you know, a, a father might leave and stop paying child support. Well, the court can actually say, hey, dad, you actually owe your mo or the mom all this money. And you're saying you don't have it. Okay, so be it. You don't have it. But what you do have is you do have your name on this property. Therefore, we're putting a lien on that property that says... When that property sells, any of the equity that's in that property is going to go towards this child support lien, okay? This can be difficult sometimes to deal with sellers because a lot of times they are requiring that they move or that they, that they get a certain amount of cash at closing. It's one of the parts of negotiation that you're going to have to work with and make sure to watch our negotiation series because I, I really, you know, there is nothing more important than negotiations in this deal. Uh, just in general, I'm not just talking about liens, but, but in general, negotiating is, is the core of everything that you're doing. But a lot of times, as part of that negotiation process, you may hit a wall where your seller just, they're not moving, they have to have $10,000 in their pocket. They have to have $5,000 in their pocket. And if they've got a child support lien or if they've got any of these other liens, they're going to take that money away that prevent them from walking away with cash because now you're hitting a wall where you're just not able to offer enough to pay off the lien and to give them money in their pocket. That can hurt, right? So you've got to know how to handle that. You've got to know how to approach that with people. But these are going to be some really common liens that you run into. Let's talk a little bit about how the lien is handled, okay? Why does the lien matter and when does the lien get paid off? Well, date is the only thing that matters in lien position, okay? Lien position says that whoever recorded first is the one that gets paid off first. So let's look at an example here. Let's say that on January 12th, our seller takes out a mortgage to Bank of America, okay? And then, February 7th, they get a mechanics lien put on their property from Joe the plumber. Comes out, does some work, our seller doesn't have the money to pay him, Joe the plumber puts a mechanics lien on it. After that, they wait another month, March 21st rolls around, and their values have skyrocketed, everything's looking good, they go out and they get a home equity line of credit. Okay, That is an option that they have as well. So now they've got three liens on the property. January 12th, February 7th, March 21st. The only thing that defines who gets paid off first is this date. So if we've got this January 12th mortgage and we've got a buyer and our buyer decides to stop paying on that mortgage, what happens to those other two liens? Well, the foreclosure occurs on the mortgage for Bank of America and then these other two liens that were out there get wiped out entirely. They're not going to, they're gonna, not going to be able to collect anything. That's why lien position is so important because a subordinate lien gets entirely wiped out if one of the upstream liens forecloses. In this case, our first lien foreclosed and it completely wipes out that mechanics and that HELOC. These guys will never see that money. So this is why traditionally when you see a second mortgage or a second lien on a property, uh, maybe Bank of America or Wells Fargo does a, does a HELOC or something, the interest rate is going to be a little bit higher on those guys. And the, and the reason why is because their risk is higher. Because if they are in second lien position and the, the person decides to stop paying on the first lien position, they understand they're not getting anything. They're completely gone, completely wiped out. Okay? Something to understand, though, about that is in lien positions, I'm talking about subordinate lien, right? I mentioned subordinate lien versus saying second lien because really all that matters is what's upstream and what's downstream. If we have this example here, our buyer continues to pay the mortgage at Bank of America, but... They decide they're not paying the mechanics lien to Joe the plumber. Joe the plumber has the option to foreclose. Joe the plumber can foreclose on that property, which then wipes out the subordinate HELOC. But the thing here is now, even though Joe the plumber has foreclosed on this property, Joe the plumber has to satisfy that mortgage to Bank of America. Because Bank of America is in a, in a uh, whatever the opposite of subordinate is, primary is what I'm going to say, upstream lien position. So they need to satisfy that somehow. Now sometimes you can do that just by continuing those payments. Sometimes they got to come up with all the cash to do that, right? So 
Joe the plumber could go to the foreclosure auction block. He could take over on that property's ownership. Let's say that he goes to foreclose on him. Nobody bids on it at the auction. He will, he will become the owner of the property, just like in any other foreclosure scenario. However, there is still that debt to Bank of America and that needs to be satisfied. So it's very important to understand lien position because our whole world revolves around lien position. We're gonna be doing a lot of things that are based on the fact that we understand there is a first lien out there. We're taking second lien position. We're then subsequently putting out essentially a third lien or a fourth lien and so on and so forth. And we need to understand what our risk analysis should be on these properties. Similarly, some of you may be looking to lend money. Some of you may be watching this video that have a decent amount in their IRA or even have a decent amount in their 401k, which by the way can be converted to a self-directed IRA, which allows you to lend and work in real estate with that money. Those of you who might not have enough to purchase a full property, maybe you've got 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. That's not enough to really go out, buy a house, fix up the house. You can do it, but it's just a little bit harder to find those deals. But what it is enough to do is lend in a second lien position to somebody like myself doing subject to, doing wraparounds. You can be the person that provides the money to catch up the loan. You can be the person that provides the money to do the rehab. But you've got to understand you're in second lien position. And if you're not working with the, the toppest of tier investor and somebody who really knows how to take care of their investors, uh, it is dangerous because if their first lien gets foreclosed on, you are wiped out. But if you start seeking out people like myself or somebody else that you might know is really active in the business and, and has a good reputation for doing those things, that is one way that you can go about making money on your money. Right? So keep that in mind too, but you've got to understand how lien positions work so that you understand what you're getting into from the start. Let's go over some basic business stuff. Let's go over some things that, that you're going to need to know just as you're starting out. Right, just so we can get some of these understandings get, uh, taken care of. A, never put anything on your personal name. Right, when you're doing contracts, everything needs to be under your LLC. Everything. The only exception I'm going to make to this is maybe if you're bird dogging with somebody, maybe you found a deal and you're going to bring it to somebody and they're going to pay you for uh, bringing that deal in. Well, it's going to go into their LLC. But as far as facing a consumer, as far as facing a seller, Never put your own personal name on your contract. Even when you're signing the contract, you're not signing it with your name. You're signing it with your name, comma, member, right? Which means that you're signing on behalf of this LLC. You could even get in trouble if you have uh, I buy real estate LLC and you put the buyer's name as I buy real estate LLC, and you go through all the contract, and then at the end you sign your own personal name, it's possible that they can break through your veil just by the fact that you put your own name and you didn't put member on it, right? So you want to be protected. It's very important to be protected in this business. Now, one very key element to your LLC is keeping your funds separated. And now watch my LLC creation video because I'm going to go through a whole, a whole smorgasbord of, of you know, how to name your LLC, what, what kind of things are going to be good to consider as you're uh, creating this name for your email and for your saying the name over the phone and that kind of stuff, where to find your names, where to, where to find how to uh, uh, file with your state, all that kind of stuff. We'll go over that in the LLC creation video. But one of the big points that I want to hit with you right now is when you create your LLC, you have to keep those funds for the business, right? Because what you can't do is you can't go buy a six pack of beer for yourself because, hey, I've got $600 in the LLC fund and I, you know, I'm down, I need to get paid next week, I don't have, I'm just gonna go buy it. I'm, because what that's called is commingling funds and that can break your corporate veil. It's called piercing the corporate veil. That allows people to get through the protections that the LLC is supposed to give you and get directly to you and your assets. So you wanna avoid doing that, but watch the LLC video, like I said, and we'll go into more details on that one. Uh, if, oh, well, there you go. You need to create your LLC, watch the LLC and, and business startup videos. Um, this is a big one. A big basic understanding that I want you to understand is, is you are an investor. You're an investor in single family real estate. You're not a wholesaler. You're not a fix and flipper. You're not a landlord. You're not an owner financer. You are an investor. Okay. And I think that that is a very important way to look at doing this business because I think a lot of people come into this business, and for those of you who have read Good to Great, you know, they've got their, your, your uh, uh, hedgehog principle, and they put their blinders on and they say, look, I'm a, I'm a fix and flipper, and I'm gonna get really good at that, and that's, that's admirable. I do admire, you know, you wanna get good at one strategy, that's cool, but the people who are saying I'm a wholesaler, 
are turning away deals left, right, and center. I, I, without exaggeration, over 80% of the deals that I close are referrals from other people like yourself. They're referrals from people that are wholesalers. And they don't know how to handle this one deal that comes across where somebody owes 90% of what it's worth, right? Or they're a fix and flipper, or they're this, or they're that. And they're not looking at the entire broad spectrum of available strategies in owner financing. And what I encourage you to do, and why this, this video series is so important to go through the whole series and learn the ins and outs of real estate investing is that I always say you gotta have a bat belt. You gotta have a bat belt with a bunch of different tools for each scenario, for each situation. Because when I'm sitting in front of a seller, when I take that seat, I know that I can do one of 20 million things. And as they tell me what their situation is, I'm like, okay, well, I can't do this one, can't do this one, can't do this one, can't do this one, until we're left with an offer that is specific to their needs and allows me to buy the house with what they need to see and allows me to make the decision if I've got multiple abilities, you know, maybe I could owner finance it, maybe I could fix and flip it. Well, now I get to make the decision which one's gonna make the most money and which one makes the most sense for right now. Do I need cash right now for another project I'm doing or can I make this one sit? as a long-term strategy for myself, right? So you get to make the decision as what the best financial gain is going to be, and you get to provide a custom-made offer to your seller. And guys, this is why my, my contracting rate is so high. I mean, I've got a, a huge conversion rate from when I sit down on, on a uh, appointment with a seller. I convert over 75% of every contract or every deal that I go on, every, every house that I go look at, I contract it because I'm able to negotiate and I'm able to understand what the needs are of that person and I'm not stuck looking at one strategy. If you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail and we don't wanna be a hammer, we wanna be a tool belt, okay? So very important that you continue to watch the series and look at the ins and outs of all your different options. As we're going through this series, we're gonna be throwing out a lot of acronyms, okay? Acronyms are just gonna be part of your life now that you're being an investor, just welcome to it, get used to it. Let's talk about what some of those acronyms are. Well. The first one that you're going to hear a lot is ARV, which stands for after repair value, okay? So one of the, the signs that I love seeing on the side of the road is, you know, oh, uh, selling houses at 50% of what it's worth. Well, it's not worth anything more than you're selling it for. Worth means what will somebody buy this for right now, right? ARV is a much better uh, way of looking at things because what it is, is that you've got to look at the comps and you've got to say, once I fix this property up, then it's going to be worth $100,000. But right now, I need to figure out what I can buy it for, right? So conventional wisdom, and we'll go into this later, conventional wisdom says buy houses at 70, 75% of their ARV. And when I talk about that, I talk about your rehab and your acquisition fits into that number. So you find your ARV would be $100,000. That means your total basis, which I'll get into here in a second, is gonna be $75,000. You back out your repairs and what you're left with is what you can pay for the house, right? Everything is based on that ARV. Everything is based off of comps. LTV is loan to value. Run into this one a lot too. Now value, again, what is it currently valued at? Uh, so if we've got that house whose ARV was 100 and we fix it up and we've spent $75,000 in both acquiring it and fixing it up, well, we would have a 75% LTV. Our loan that we took from our hard money lender or from our private lender or whoever, that would be 75% of its current value. So that is 75% LTV. Basis. Basis is a, is a big one because you can use it for a couple of different terms. You can say, what's the cash basis? What's your total basis? But basis essentially means what do you have in the deal? Okay, so if you're looking at, let's say, a, a, an owner financed deal and you're taking over on payments, right? You're, you're doing a subject to acquisition and you take over on payments and they owe $75,000 to the bank, right? So you take over on that $75,000, but you have to put $5,000 worth of repairs in and you have to put $5,000 down to uh, catch the loan up because they're behind on payments. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna be very basic here. Watch our subject two videos because I'm also gonna to explain to you how it's not just as simple of math as I'm throwing out to you right now, but for, the, for where we are right now, this is gonna be how I explain to it. So we've got 75,000, we're taking over, we put five in to catch up the payments, we put five in uh, on rehab. That's an extra 10. So now our total basis is basically $85,000.
but our cash basis is only 10. You've only put 10,000 of your actual cash in on the deal. So that might be something that's important to you as you're, as you're uh, analyzing this deal. Well, you might analyze an offer that comes in and look at it and say, gosh, I don't know if this is gonna work for me. I've got a cash basis on this thing at 10,000 bucks. I already put 10 grand in, so I need to get 10 grand out, right? Or you may need to know what your total basis is because you can't sell it for $80,000 if, if you've got a total basis of 85 in there, right? It might be easy to say, well, I sell it for $80,000. I only owe $75,000, I'm, I'm great. But your total basis was 85, so you're not really doing yourself any favor there. So basis is another one that can be difficult to understand but that's something you need to, to get into. Cents, percent, cents on the dollar, so your basis versus your ARV. There's gonna be a lot of times when you hear deals get thrown around, they're gonna say, man, I bought this, this deal at 75 cents. It means they bought it at 75% of the ARV. If you're, uh, like I mentioned earlier, your conventional wisdom says buy at 70 to 75%, that's all I'm gonna say, 70, 75%. The implication is, it's 70 to 75% of the ARV, and that 70 or 75% includes the money you're paying the seller, and it includes the money that you're putting towards rehab. It does not include like closing costs and uh, holding costs, that kind of stuff. One of the reasons why we have a lower uh, basis number, one of the reasons why we, why we go for that 70 or 75% is because that discount that we're taking is there to absorb things like holding costs that kind of deal. Now, it's always a good idea when you're running your numbers and you're trying to figure out what your actual profits are going to be. Yes, of course, include your holding costs. Of course, include the closing costs, that kind of stuff. But when you're buying the property and you're analyzing it, we're just gonna go off of, hey, I'm willing to pay 75 cents for this deal, okay? So why would we want to owner finance? Let's go through some pros and cons of owner financing. Well, one big pro is the tenants, toilets, and trash, right? When you are a landlord, you have to deal with tenants, toilets, and trash. I don't like dealing with tenants, toilets, and trash. It, it, I always, whenever I'm speaking publicly, I make people raise your hand. You know, raise your hand if you have a mortgage on your house, and everybody raise it. Keep your hand raised if you've ever called that mortgage company and told them that your toilet was leaking, right? The mortgage company doesn't care. The mortgage company gets their payment every month on the 1st, and if they don't receive it by the 15th, they get a late fee. And if they don't get that late fee, and that happens for a couple of months, you get foreclosed on and they get the property back. It's the buyer's responsibility to pay for the taxes, the repairs, the insurance, the general upkeep, all that kind of stuff. That's not the bank's problem. Well, with owner financing, you're the bank. That's, that's what we're doing here. You're becoming the bank for somebody, right? Though you're selling them the property, you're also providing that financing and you don't have to deal with the tenants, toilets, and trash. That's a big pro to dealing with owner financing. What's another one? You get set actual returns. Again, I'm gonna compare this to landlording. When you're a landlord, I run into this all the time. I talk to people and they go, well, I, I'm cash flowing $600 a month on my rental. Okay, well, what makes you say that? Well, you know, I have to pay $600 a month and, uh, or did I say 600? I have to pay $400 a month and uh, I only pay, or and they pay me $1,000 a month for rent. Okay, so there's a $600 difference there, but that's gross returns. That's not an actual profit. Because what happens when that air conditioning unit goes out and you gotta spend another $5,000 or $6,000, well, your, your whole profits for that year are shot, right? Perhaps more. So it's, it's really important to understand that when you're doing the owner financing side of things, if you're getting $350 a month, you're getting $350 a month. There's no other added expenses that come to that. You might have to pay uh, $650 a month to the bank, and then you're receiving $1,000 a month. That's it. You have actual returns that you can count on from this point in time. There are no other things that add into it. So that's another pro. What's a con? A con would be lost appreciation. When you sell with owner financing, you've sold the house. You are no longer the owner of that property. So you cannot, uh, you cannot capitalize on the fact if uh, if the house value goes up in the future, that belongs to the buyer now. That's theirs. That's not yours anymore, okay? So you do lose that appreciation. You're trading that off for the, the, the consistency and knowing that you've got your returns, but you're not gonna be able to eventually sell that thing for the higher price. You already, you already sold. You already took your profit. What's another pro? You're in your own niche. There's not a whole heck of a lot of people that are doing owner financing comparatively. When you look at the entire realm of, of, of real estate investors, 
there's only a select few of us that are actually getting out there and really heavily pushing towards the owner financing stuff, the subject to that kind of thing. And that's one of the things that has given me success in this business is because I'm the guy. I'm the guy that people can go to and learn how to do this subject to stuff. I'm the guy that people can go to and partner up with deals. You know, that, that has helped me tremendously as I go to these RIA clubs and that kind of stuff, people know that I've got this niche and I really encourage you to find a niche and to be good at it. You should know how to do everything, but when you've got a niche and you're good at it, people know that you're that person and can go to you for that, that kind of deal. There's also a low barrier to entry. This is very similar to, to wholesaling in that way. I mean, really you gotta pay for your marketing and that's about it. There are ways to structure every other part of the deal where you literally don't have to have any money to buy the house with subject to. And that's one of the really cool things. When I started this business, guys, I was a nine to fiver. I was making $45,000 a year, something like that, uh, under 50 regardless. I didn't have any cash in the bank saved. I had enough money to shoot out some marketing and that was it. And I built, I built my whole investing career off of nothing. My first 45, 50 houses, I literally didn't spend a single dollar from my back pocket on because I leveraged other things. I leveraged how uh, option contracts worked, I leveraged how we had buyers out there ready to go, leveraged private lenders, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you, you've got a low barrier to entry to get in here. Now I will give the caveat of, it takes no money to buy a property, but you should have money to hold that property, okay? So even if that means when you sell the property with owner financing, you get a 10% down payment, just set that, set that down payment aside, don't touch it. Leave that there because you don't know, maybe, your buyer stops paying and you're gonna have to foot the bill for your underlying mortgage for a few months. And then you're gonna have to pay for a foreclosure and maybe you're gonna have to pay to fix a couple things up before you resell it, that kind of stuff. So it's good to have that money ready to go, but you can use the deal to get that money. So it takes no money to get in, takes money to hold. Uh, what's next? We've got foreclosures, which the foreclosure is a con but it's also kind of a pro. You can watch our show foreclosure video to see a little bit more of what I mean by that, but here's the thing. Okay, like I mentioned before, somebody stops paying. That sucks. You've gotta pay your underlying mortgage. You've gotta to continue to pay for that debt for however long, two, three, four, six months before you're able to get that person out of the property, okay? That's no fun. But whenever you do get that person out of the property, typically you're able to take that property back at the foreclosure auction, and then you're able to sell it again. For now, the, the appreciated price, because it has been time, right? So ideally, the, the values have been going up, so now you get to sell it for a little bit more. You're starting a new 30-year note, and let's say it took that first person five, six years before you foreclosed on them. Well, they just paid five or six years down on your underlying mortgage. They just paid for that debt for however long, so now, you actually, long story short, make a ton more money on the foreclosure scenario than you would if that first buyer had just worked out for you the whole time. Now, I always say morally, ethically, it is imperative that you put people into your properties that you honestly feel like can pay for the property. That's one of the reasons why it's really important to shoot somebody through an RMLO, look at their financials, figure out that they can buy it. You've gotta put people in that can pay for that property because it can come back to you to bite you in multiple ways, not just morally, but also legally, that can bite you in the bum. But if you've done everything that you think is good, right, and you put somebody that you genuinely felt could pay for the property and they can't, it's okay, you're gonna make a ton more money in the long run. There are lots of legalities, like I mentioned there. I mean, there's, there's Dodd-Frank, uh, there's state local laws that have to do with financing. You've gotta be aware of those. But the good news is, is there are people out there that take care of that for you. Your attorneys are going to take care of that, a, a lot of those legalities for you. Your RMLO, your Residential Mortgage Loan Originator, is going to take care of a lot of that for you. I founded Texas Pride Lending several years ago uh, specifically for that, that exact need. There are people like yourself who don't want to have to go through and read Dodd-Frank like I did. You don't want to have to know all the ins and outs of the legalities of what you can and can't do nationally and statewide like I do. But you can have this service over here that takes care of that for you. Now, I've since sold Texas Pride Lending. That's now run by Sarah Montez, but they do a great job. They're still under the same uh, principles and everything that, that it was founded under. And that's a one way to take care of those legalities. So there's a lot of things that you do need to be aware of, but there are services that take care of that for you. One of my biggest and most favorite pros of this is the unlimited funding aspect. Like I mentioned before, 
a lot of you may be very stuck in the conventional mind frame of, hey, I go get a loan from a bank, that means I can buy properties, right? But I know the conventional lending, you know, they allow you to get like 10, I think, last time I checked, loans under your name before they cut you off. Uh, shoot, I do 10 in a month. That's, I mean, with subject two, I mean, nobody is telling you no. Your job is just to sit in front of a seller and say, I can do this and show them what the options are. They say yes, they sign the contract, boom, you're done. This is how you build a large portfolio of cash flowing properties without ever having to put your personal name on anything is through the subject to realm. That's a big pro. And then non-recourse. Like I mentioned, it's not your personal name. Everything is done through your LLC. So until this year, I had never put my own personal name on a loan ever. So worst case scenario, if things went bad, nothing's actually gonna come back on me. Now, once you get to a certain degree, once you get to a certain level, once you start using private money and going to banks and that kind of stuff and you kind of build, you are gonna have to do personal guarantees eventually. But that doesn't mean that you can't start. I mean, I built a multi-million dollar portfolio without ever having my personal name on a single property before and that's pretty cool, right? So guys, this is a, this is a, a huge series. We're really going to go and dive, uh, deep dive into everything about the investing world. We're really going to dive deep and, and learn really a lot about this owner financing side, how the technicalities of that work. So stick with the program. Stick with us. Keep in, uh, keep in touch with us too. I'd like to hear your feedback. I'd like to hear if some of this stuff helps you. Reach out to me and let me know. Uh, look out for Propelio.com. Propelio.com is just an amazing product always adding new stuff that's really gonna help new and old investors alike. So uh, find us, find them on Facebook, on Twitter, all your social media, YouTube, like, subscribe, all that kind of fun stuff, and keep in touch with us. And until next time, keep on learning.